Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure for me to speak to you today. Although, of course, I also would like to apologize for not being physically with you. Unfortunately, I had to cancel at the last minute my trip to Australia. Uh, the topic of my presentation today will be risk sharing, income distribution, and inclusive growth. I will report on recent research done at the OECD on these topics, which hopefully will provide some interesting inputs for you. So let me start by saying uh, what are the main topics I will touch upon. Slide number two, please. Uh, I will look at two related issues. First of all, I look at risk sharing. By that, I mean how policy institutions can shape the way financial and macroeconomic shocks affect uh, employment, welfare, and performance of the economy. The second part will be a specific uh, zoom on some of these issues, in particular looking at the relationship between income and inequality, and again looking at how policy measures and policy institutions can provide different trade-offs or sometimes win-win situations when looking at uh, uh, growth and income inequality. So let me go to slide number three, please. Let me start with the impact of shocks. Well, of course, we live at times in which macroeconomic and financial shocks continue to be a feature of the way our macroeconomies perform. And we have already gone through five years of the great financial crisis to know that this is producing significant impacts in all parts of the world. However, we also are beginning to see that the specific impacts of any given shock do change uh, given uh, how the policy institutions are shaped and activated in different countries. And indeed, one of the aims of our research is to look at how different institutional models, let me put it that way, in different countries, in OECD and outside the OECD, do generate different responses to shocks, so different risk sharing. Uh, so let me go to number four now and begin with this example. One of the uh, most disturbing consequences of the crisis is, is youth unemployment. And you can see from this slide in the panel on the left that the rise in youth unemployment over the past five years has been much more significant than the rise of overall unemployment, which uh, in any case has been and remains significant, especially in some parts of the world. However, for a given youth unemployment shock, uh, we see that the impact in terms of unemployment is significantly different according to labor market institutions. The panel in the right shows how the existence or the non-presence of minimum wage requirements would generate different youth unemployment performance. So in the case where there is no minimum wage, the impact on youth unemployment is lower than with respect in those cases in which there is a minimum wage. So you immediately begin to see where the general problem lies. There may be trade-offs that are generated by specific labor and product market rules or institutions. And this is one of the key themes of OECD research, which has been ongoing for some time. Next slide, please. Slide number five. Uh, another example, unemployment benefits, which are a very important element of the toolkit of social policies in many uh, advanced and even emerging economies. Again, here we see a significant difference in the response in terms of poverty rates increases following a shock uh, according to whether you have or not in place unemployment benefits. The presence of unemployment benefits mitigates to a significant extent the impact on poverty of a given exogenous shock. But let me go forward on this. So next slide, please, slide number six. Uh, and again, here we see some evidence of a trade-off. Uh, job protection helps uh, lower income earners, but this may come at the expense of youth unemployment. 
So you may be uh, facing a situation in which, as you can see from the slide, uh, unemployment protect uh, job protection may uh, uh, mitigate the impact of shocks, but this may come at the expense of larger youth unemployment. So again, uh, this uh, signals the fact that if we have to draw lessons from the financial crisis, and one of the lessons being we have to build and operate more effective social norms, institutions, and policies, once, once we do that, we will have to look at the unintended consequences, and this might be certainly one. I'm saying this because uh, looking at those issues, the OECD is about to launch a major research activity which will extensively look at the unintended consequences of policy uh, institutions and policy tools. Let me look at the next slide, slide number seven, and bring in the impact uh, not only of labor market uh, reforms but product market reforms. Here what we see is a, uh, something which in the experience of uh, product market uh, competition enhancing reforms, we, we tend to uh, witness in a number of countries. Namely that more competition in product markets will uh, generate more employment. Uh, but this is also to be related to uh, youth unemployment, the issue which we were just discussing where there is pro-competitive product market regulation, meaning where there is more competition in product markets, the negative impact on youth unemployment is much less than in the opposite case. So in this situation, from this slide, you see how the undesirable impacts of some specific policy norms in the labor markets have on youth unemployment could mitigate it by more competition in product market. So this suggests that when designing reform policies and trying to avoid unintended consequences, one should uh, try to d define policy mixes, baskets of policies that also uh, deal with these unintended consequences. Next slide, please, slide number eight. So once uh, we realize that uh, there are different packages of policies in different countries and these have different impacts uh, on, uh, on employment or youth unemployment and, and product market performance. Uh, one obvious next step is try to ask whether there are uh, clusters, of mo uh, clusters of public policy in labor markets and product markets and what our research suggests that this is the case. It is always difficult to uh, block into specific um, criteria kinds of uh, uh, structural measures in labor and product markets, but one broad classification could be the following. There are some institutions which are aimed at strengthening social protection, for instance, unemployment benefits, minimum wages, and so forth, while there are other institutions which strengthen and facilitate reallocation. Now, think of what the impact of the great uh, financial uh, recession has been in many economies. On the one hand, the initial shock has produced a significant rise in unemployment, which uh, requires uh, coping with that, imp with that shock in terms of protecting especially the most vulnerable. But at the same time, it has generated the need to reallocate resources, most notably uh, employment, so that the economy could once again move towards a sustainable growth path. Unfortunately, of course, let me add that we are not yet there in many countries, and many countries are still struggling uh, with uh, returning to sustainable growth. Apart from that, our research identifies different clusters. And from the slide, you can see that, for instance, English-speaking countries and Asian OECD countries do belong to a group of countries where the so-called reallocation facilitating institutions, the ones that uh, facilitate moving, for instance, workers, but also companies from one production line, one sector to another, are uh, more relevant. At the other extreme, in a way, are the so-called 
continental European and Eastern European models, as you can see on the lower uh, right-hand side panel of this diagram, uh, where what is privileged is the role of uh, social protection of labor market institutions. The ideal case, of course, seems to be one in which you have both social protection institutions and reallocation institutions so that at the same time you offer protection against the shock but at the same time you allow resources and, and, and labor and capital to be reallocated towards more growth enhancing measures. Well, last but not least in the left hand lower panel you see the emerging OECD economies and the BRICS for which of course we do a full coverage of our structural analysis where institutions of both kinds are somehow missing. So let me go now to the next slide please, slide number nine, to try to summarize this first part of my presentation. Remember the point is uh, to try to understand how in a situation in which major macroeconomic and financial shocks hit economies, how uh, local, national, domestic institutions provide or not a response to those shocks, provide insurance, provide protection or provide means to reallocate resources. Uh, the general conclusion is that it does matter a lot how those institutions are designed because in some cases if they produce the scope, the, the, the result for which they were designed, for instance, protecting the lower income segments of workers, they might also lead to unintended negative consequences, for instance, by enhancing youth unemployment. Other institutions, for instance, product market uh, liberalization measures, uh, by facilitating competition, they facilitate investment in companies and they uh, boost uh, employment because they boost uh, business growth. So again, this is one piece of evidence which we have began just to look at at the OECD, but which we think that it is uh, of some relevance as all countries try to understand how they can redesign their public policy toolkit in, uh, in shaping what will hopefully be the post-crisis world. I say hopefully because coming from Europe, certainly you do not feel that you're out of the crisis yet. In this part of the world where you are, I guess the situation is somehow more favorable. Well, let me come to the second part of my presentation now, which is more specific. Uh, it is also based on very recent uh, work that we've done at the OECD related to our going for growth analysis, which is the regular structural analysis we produce on a yearly basis asking what countries can and should do in terms of structural reforms and assessing what they have done and assessing also what they have obtained in terms of structural measures. Um, we have began looking at the so-called side effects of reforms that initially were conceived with the specific goal of enhancing growth. Growth, of course, remains very much a key target of economic policies. However, one of the lessons that we think should be taken extremely seriously in designing policies is that growth alone is not enough in assessing uh, the policy uh, strategy of a country. And certainly other dimensions have to be taken into consideration, one of which is, I believe, certainly inequality. To do that, what we need to know as a first step is what happens to other variables when we pursue growth enhancing measures. And this specific point I'm going to discuss in a minute is exactly uh, trying to answer that question. How, uh, what happens to inequality when we pursue growth enhancing measures? This is part of a broad analysis, as I said, which, is, uh, which has been ongoing in the OECD and we intend to further develop in the future. So let me, uh, let me go to this uh, first part, for the s first slide of the second part, income inequalities. Next slide, number 10, is what I just said. Number 11 is uh, a summary of my second part of the presentation. First of all, let me remind that inequality had been rising and been rising on a continuous path for some time before the crisis. 
And this indeed has, has been highlighted by many as one of the deep reasons that might have led for their consequences to the crisis itself. When the crisis broke out, of course, the immediate impact of the crisis has been a drop in GDP per capita. This, as a side effect, has produced a paradox, or in any case, the apparent paradox of reducing inequality. Unfortunately, this reduction in inequality has taken place for the wrong reasons. We would like to see a world where you get, at the same time, growth and less inequality. So, how can we achieve that? This is a key question, and the evidence I'm going to discuss in a minute uh, will provide some examples of how to move forward. So, next slide, please, slide number 12. So, as I said, uh, again, this is very much a policy-oriented exercise, uh, and this is, of course, in line with what the OECD does. In, in principle, what we, the OECD tries to produce policy advice that is useful to countries, and uh, this exercise is very much in that spirit. So what we have done at the OECD is, first of all, to provide some cross-country comparison of income inequality. We have tried to analyze the determinants of income inequality and therefore try to identify policy trade-offs. This is not an easy task, and we are, in a way, uh, in, in the middle of this exercise. We have produced already a number of reports, uh, but more needs to be done. And just to give you an impression, let me show you what that means. For instance, let me go to slide number 13. First of all, let me start with a few facts. Um, income inequality has a great degree of variation across countries. You see that in the slide. You also will recognize the red bar where Australia stands, it is a little bit on the high side of inequality, although uh, not so far away, not si such uh, extreme cases as Mexico or Chile, as you can see from that diagram. Uh, other countries at the opposite have uh, much less inequality. Denmark uh, leads the way. So this is uh, the first evidence. But then, uh, moving on, next slide, please. Uh, we ask the question, all right, what is the correlation, if any, between inequality and growth? And that, that, that slide, I guess, provides the answer very forcefully. There is no obvious correlation. Uh, so it is not obvious uh, from the start that there might be a trade-off or a significant correlation. However, this does not mean that we may not improve our policy design to uh, strengthen both the equality dimension and the growth dimension. This is the purpose of this exercise. Let me, let me turn to the next slide, slide number 15, please. Well, this rather uh, awkward-looking uh, slide tries to convey the following message. In order to understand inequality, first of all, you have to understand where the income comes for a unit, and the unit we have taken as a measurement unit and is the family. So uh, the middle set of uh, squares identify the steps that from an accounting point of view we have made to move from individual labor income towards household adjusted disposable income. And there are a number of steps. You move from the individual to the household, then you move to the household market income, then you move on to the disposable household income and finally to the adjusted disposable income. Uh, you will see that the difference between the different components of that slide have to do with a number of elements of driving forces on the upper uh, half of that slide. In the, in the blue boxes you will see that, for instance, moving from the individual income to the household labor income, you will have to take into consideration family formation and composition. Again, moving forward to the household market income, you will have to uh, include self-employment and capital income in addition, in addition to the individual labor income, which was your starting point, and so on. I will not uh, spend too much time on, on details. The important point is, as you move forward, and you add components to the definition of your final variable, which is 
household adjusted disposable income, you have to take into consideration how policy shapes that. In other words, here it is. Here it is the point we're looking for. As we try to understand how income availability and inequality develops, we at the same time must ask the question, how is it that policies shape that? And therefore, how is it that we can design policies in a way that they produce more desirable results? And this is what I show you uh, going on. Next slide, please, 16. This, again, is a difficult-to-read slide, and apologies for that. But the main message uh, you should try to take out of that slide is quite simple. Uh, we have produced a number of econometric analyses looking at the different components of the uh, available income you have seen in the previous slide, and this just shows you what are the, uh, in our findings, the empirical determinants of, of labor income. And in the middle of that slide, you will, si you will find four uh, boxes, each one uh, is related, each one of which is related to a major determinant of um, uh, income inequality. So you will find elements which are probably familiar to most of you in determining inequality, such as technical change and globalization, education policies, labor market policies, and gender gap. All of those four elements are major determinants with different weights, of course, but are important. And it is obvious that each one of those, or rather the impact that each one of those has on uh, income inequality is also dependent on policies. So let me look at that. Next slide, please, slide 17. This is just an example, and it probably drives home, again, something which is familiar to you. Educational attainment is a very powerful element in driving inequality down. Uh, the more you uh, are effective in educational att attainment, in terms of this slide, upper secondary or post-secondary non-tertiary education, earnings of workers improve. So this is uh, a well-known result. Uh, what is, uh, uh, in a way, new here is that this is put in the context of the general policy toolkit, uh, along many other policies to, to assess the impact on inequality. And let me go further on this next slide, slide 18. This is another example of something which works the other way. Uh, one instrument which has been widespread both before the crisis and even during the crisis to mitigate uh, uh, the unemployment impact has been temporary contracts. However, we find that that kind of contract can produce very undesirable inequality results. And uh, the bottom line of the slide is that workers on temporary contracts earn less, particularly those that have the lower income in, t in temporary terms. So again, this is one example of how specific policies which may be put in place to address a very relevant challenge such as, uh, uh, such as unemployment, and I'm uh, thinking about what we were discussing earlier on on the impact of macroeconomic shocks may have unintended consequences in terms of inequality. Let me go further down. So slide number 19. And here uh, I will have a set of three slides where I will provide examples of how some policies are win-win policies, while in other cases we have found that there might be trade-offs which have to be taken into account. This first slide uh, shows examples of win-win strategies. On, along the rows, you find policy tools, equity in education, secondary and tertiary graduation rates, initiatives to foster immigrants, and so forth. And on the columns, you have the impact on a number of key variables, such as the employment rate, earnings, equality, GDP per capita. In this case, this slide produces a very clear message. There are policies, especially in the education domain, as we have seen just a minute ago, where there is a win-win, where you have um, more equality, more employment, more growth. Fine. This is something we really appreciate, and the policy implications are very clear. 
However, this is not always the case, as we see in the next slide, slide number 20. There are some cases where there are clear trade-offs. Here, the policy variables we take into consideration by row on the left are, for instance, the minimum wage, the degree of unionization, the legal extension of collective wage settlements, and, for instance, product market regulations. Here, the picture is mixed. You can see for yourself that in some cases there are trade-offs where you see a, a negative sign. In other cases, again, you have a win-win situation. In still, in other cases, you do not know. Uh, we still do not know, and therefore, in those cases, the obvious implication is that you have to go specific. Uh, and this is one uh, element I would like to stress at this point. We are drawing somehow general conclusions. However, once this has to be transferred into specific policy advice for any specific country, certainly we have to look at the details to try to understand what could be the results in terms of win-win or in terms of trade-off. The last slide from this point of view, next slide, 21, is related to uh, a specific policy area, which is the tax policy area. This is extremely relevant in any case, it is certainly extremely relevant today when many, if not all, countries have to deal with fiscal consolidation. So they have to act on the spending side, of course, but in many cases, spending side is not enough, and so tax policies have to be put in place. One obvious recommendation that comes out from this point of view is that once a government decides to increase revenues to address fiscal consolidation needs, the composition certainly of the spending side, spending cut, therefore. But also the tax side is extremely important in determining not only the impact on growth, but also on other variables such as inequality. So it's very much up to governments to understand uh, what are the side effects or the trade-offs of a given tax policy measure that's been introduced. And here there is a list. I will not go through it. Uh, these tax measures have different impacts on the, on, the, on the two variables. And in this case, we present the two main ones, inequality, income uh, equality and GDP per capita. So I'm about to end, and my next slide simply is uh, just to, uh, again, um, thank you for your attention. Again, apologies, I would have loved being with you uh, today, and I am sure that this would be a very successful conference. Thank you very much for your attention.